maybe one more minute before we start. Um, lots of friendly faces so far. What else have we got? Cool, cool, cool. Oh, hi, I can see Kate. That's really nice. <laughs> Kate used to work at National Voices briefly as a maternity cover. Uh, so, yeah, early days, early days. Oh, cool, there's of people. Excellent. Right, I'll start. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Charlotte. I assume you know me, but you might not. I'm the Chief Executive of National Voices. This is, I think, our fourth or fifth webinar we're doing. Um, we all think, oh, uh, maybe we move to fortnightly because it's quite a lot for us to organise in a very small team. Um, but then there's always so much stuff that happens every week. So at the moment, I think we just have to continue doing them weekly. Um, we're going to talk about the technology in a minute and then about the agenda. Um, for now, it's probably quite useful if you mute yourself, you can introduce yourself in the chat. Um, but at any point, you can unmute yourself and speak. This is not against the rules. It's just quite useful if we're not all unmuted because then we get echoes and uh, feedback and all the rest of it. Um, I'm going to ask Sam now, I think, to briefly walk us through the technology. Hi, everyone. I'm Sam. I'm the comms officer at National Voices. You've probably already seen me in the past webinars, but if you haven't used WebEx before, I need to quickly how to use the technology. Uh, if you haven't used WebEx before, there are six icons at the bottom of your screen at the moment. Uh, there's one to unmute yourself, control your video, and there's a chat icon, which is a speech icon. If you could launch that now, that'd be great. And then just say who you are, where, you, where you're from as well, so we can say hi. Um, as Charlotte said, if you could um, keep yourself on mute throughout, that'd be great just to reduce feedback. If you've got anything you want to say, you can raise your hand. Um, or if you just wave, we'll, we'll pick you up. Or say in the chat you want to say something and we'll let you speak. Um, you can chat to people privately and you can also chat to the whole chat as well, which is if you select everyone or someone else for scrolling. Um, yeah, so that is it. And just say we're recording this and we'll keep the recording and the chat and we'll circulate the recording after we're done today. Back to you, Charlotte. Excellent. So before we kick off with the agenda, I can't see all the faces on here. Is Rebecca online or has she failed to sign up yet because she's got technology issues? Uh, I think she's not on. All right. Oh, no, she is. She is. Sorry. Hello. I can let me to now. Oh, no. <laughs> Hang on. Uh, I think Rebecca's, she's online, but she can't, uh, no, she's now dropped off. Uh, we can maybe introduce at the end, Charlotte. Okay. Well, do flag if she's online and happy to, and then uh, I'll introduce her. She's our new head of policy, so this was her first week in the job, and what a week to start uh, working at a new organisation. So, you know, um, warmest welcome to Rebecca, and if we can flag her in later, we will. We've got an action pack agenda again. Um, I'm going to run briefly through what we did last week and what we are doing since. Um, I'm then going to spend a little bit of time um, talking about a big project we are soft launching next week. We've called it Our COVID Voices. I've spoken to many of you about this already, but if you're new, I hope I can go all the way back to the start and, and start making sense of it for you. And then we've got two um, points raised by members of National Voices. Um, one um, from Freddie about changes to community healthcare prioritisation. And she just wants to flag with you that this has come up as quite an issue for some of their beneficiaries and wants to check whether it's come up as an issue for you and whether there is something you might want to do together. And then um, we've got Emily coming um, to talk to us. She is normally employed by one of our members but has been furloughed. And um, she's currently volunteering for the Disability Benefits Consortium. And obviously, many of the people we are supporting and working with and for um, claim disability benefits. So um, she's updating us on a campaign that they are launching next week. And then finally, we will talk a bit about um, plans for next week and um, ask you whether there's anything else we should be doing at next week's webinar or in the meantime. Right. So. 
Feedback from last week's webinar. Um, we had, if you were on, you will recall, we had Emily here and Sarah who both work for NHS England and they lead on the work stream around vulnerable and extremely vulnerable people. And um, I think what happened, um, they found it really useful. They really enjoyed it. I spoke to them afterwards. But what happened, I think, happens a lot at the moment in conversations with system partners. I'm sure you'll find the same. We say there's a problem here, and they say, yeah, but we've issued guidance on this, so it should be sorted. And then we have to say, yeah, but it isn't sorted. So I think it was a bit like that, but they found it really useful, and they've taken two points uh, to government partners. Let me remember where, which ones there were. There was one around um, partners and family members of people who need to shield and their employment rights, so they've taken that to um, government. And the other one was, I think, around the support offer for people who aren't uh, extremely vulnerable, but vulnerable. Um, they also agreed to come again in a few weeks' time and talk about um, the continuation of shielding and how we will organize clinical care for people in that category, as shielding probably will in one way or another continue. So I've accepted that as an offer and thought that would be a really useful opportunity to help them shape their thinking, because I think they found it really useful to talk to the experts in your ranks and, and understand that you really know your onions, which sometimes I think people in the end just don't assume. So that was one really important thing we did last week, and hopefully further action will follow from that. Sue came last week and spoke about um, employment rights and what they have learned at uh, ARMA, the, the musculoskeletal um, umbrella organization, and she shared really generously all their learning. And then we took that onto Twitter as well, because we felt um, that this was something a lot of helpline staff and a lot of advisors would find useful. So we, we did a little bit of a sort of Twitter thread that explained bits of guidance people could access and all the rest of it. And then someone at the last um, webinar raised this issue about a campaign, the Disability Benefits Consortium is starting next week, and so that's why we've got that on the agenda today. And we also flagged last week that we wanted to talk to you this week about um, the Our COVID Voices project. So I will commence and do that now, if that's all right. Um, so Sam, if you go to the next slide. so. Lots of words on this slide, and that's partly to do with the fact that I think what we've got here are um, shots of uh, a phone website. So if you look at this project on a phone, this is what it might look like, which is why it's these sort of strips of wallpaper. Uh, you will obviously get those slides afterwards, and you can then read all the little words. Um, and we need to obviously take some of the details still with a pinch of salt. We're working with AOP, who are a tech for good company, and they are working really hard, but we're not quite finished yet. So what I want to talk to you about very briefly is why are we doing this? And then I want to talk to you about um, how are we doing this? So we are doing this because we think we are entering really uncharted water in terms of decisions about large groups of people um, about stuff that's really very unprecedented, like you mustn't leave the house. Um, and we think it is absolutely of paramount importance that the people who make those decisions understand what actually goes on for the people they're making decisions about. And whilst we're talking more about health policy and health workforce and health spending than we ever have, I think, in this country, it seems to me that the voices of those who actually live with long-term conditions and live with disability are very curiously absent from these discussions. So we felt there was a desperate need to bring together the experiences of people who are living through these times and to enable them to shape the narrative about what actually goes on for people. So if we end up deciding that shielding needs to be extended, I think it's really important that those people who make the decisions can hear from people who are shielding what it's like, what helps, what hinders, and what do they want by way of support to make it work. So we initially were hoping for a more formal partnership with The Guardian, and I think I've spoken to some of you about that. That's now not happening. But what we are doing is we're collaborating with one Guardian journalist called John Harris. You can find him on The Guardian website. He does a lot of video stuff at the moment. He does a series called Anywhere About Westminster. And today or tomorrow, he's launching a first film he's done in collaboration with National Voices, featuring three people who are shielding or self-isolating. And he found it a very, very enlightening experience. 
and he wants to do this more and again. And we have lined up for future uh, publication a program about homelessness um, and COVID and a program um, on learning disability and COVID. But he also wants to come back to those people and maybe roll some other people in with long-term conditions and ask them how they're faring. So that's a really nice accessible way that we can um, collaborate with The Guardian and also reach really quite large audiences because these videos he makes, they get more than 100,000 views quite quickly. So um, it's a good way to get our stories out there. But then in parallel, and what I've been really focusing on and what the team have been really focusing on is that we're pulling together this web line, uh, this platform and website called it Our COVID Voices. And it enables anyone to upload their story um, up to 700 words um, and to contribute in a way to this first draft of history we're writing. We are also asking people whether they consent to being recontacted by National Voices in the future. And I think that could potentially become a real game changer as well for how we go about influencing decision makers. Because if we can go to NHS England and say, or to the government, you're making decisions about extending shielding right now, well, we can field X number of people who are shielding right now and ask them additional questions or bring them into meetings. I think that will really enable us to lead in this area on the basis of people's experiences. Um, so what you're looking at here is a bit of writing for people who are thinking of contributing and the sort of why are we doing this blurb. And I really like um, the last sentence on there and it's very, very small, but it says things will be different than they are now. We want to make sure that they're also better. Um, so if you go forward, Sam, to the next couple of pages, just to sort of wave that in front of people. Um, we have got something there we call the contract with people, which explains, you know, what we will do and won't do with their story. Um, is there another page? Or is, yes, there's some FAQs, which explain, again, the sort of um, background to the project and why we're asking people to contribute. Um, and I think that is probably it by way of website pages for me to wave at you right now. So here's our ask. Um, you obviously know a whole load of people who live with mental or physical ill health or disability, and we want to really load the sample of people who contribute to this to those people. Obviously, we're interested in everyone's story, but we are really keen to amplify the voices of those who live with ongoing health um, conditions mental ill health, disability, or those who look after them. And so we would be so grateful if you could start reaching out to people you're supporting and working with and ask them to write for us. We are also working with a filmmaker um, who has been furloughed from his organization. Um, and he is on the call today, I think he's called Adam. Um, I don't know whether he could wave at people or even say a word. Um, and Adam is happy to edit film material people might want to contribute. So if you know people who might enjoy filming themselves as they go about their daily lives, um, you know, wh when and how they have breakfast and the view from their window and their pets and how they're coping with their medicines and how they're coping with pain or loneliness or carers' responsibilities or whatever else they want to talk about and describe, he will um, cut this into short videos that we can use on social media and also publish on this website I've just talked about. I've just seen Adam has introduced himself. Um, on uh, yeah, I'm, I'm here, Charlotte. Oh, hello. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, yeah, I've just been furloughed. I, my day job is working for the NHS Confederation, but uh, well, I'm on furlough at the moment, so I'm volunteering with uh, National Voices to help them and speaking to various um, uh, potential contributors to get them to video themselves on their smartphones or via Skype or Zoom, whichever is going to be most appropriate, um, so that we can capture those stories um, and edit those into into a number of short videos that um, we can use on social media that you can use on the National Voices site as part of our COVID, our COVID Voices. Excellent. So, um, you know, really generous, really generous from Adam to, to spend his time typing helping us to tell those stories. Um, please do bear that in mind as you reach out to the people you work with, but that's also an offer. 
we also uh, are interested in photos because we think they make um, they, they're very useful for social media and for us um, getting people interested in this. We decided against people being able to themselves upload photos or videos. We were advised that that is really quite tricky to make sure that those photos don't identify anyone who doesn't want to be identified and so on. And therefore, um, we will we will kind of commission photos or videos. But people can themselves tell their stories in 700 words. There is a, up to 700 words. There is a light touch editing process that goes on. We're not at all copy editing. We're just checking that it's within the rules. I've shown in an earlier slide that we just remind people not to identify anyone who hasn't consented to this, that they can remain anonymous, that it's probably best not to kind of name individual services or hospital wards or the like, but to sort of keep it a bit more general and that we will need to make sure that all the writing stays within the law in terms of um, not abusing people's human rights. But other than that, we will not start correcting people's grammar or style. These are not polished case studies we're after. Um, these are actual first person accounts of what goes on for them. The person who is spending a lot of time working on this is another person who's working for us as a volunteer. And that's Laura, and I think she's also on the call. Um, Laura, if you could unmute yourself. And just I'm here. Hello. Hi. Hi, all. You will have received plenty of emails from me, so this is what I look like. <laughs> Laura, I've got by far the fanciest headphones. <laughs> and that's what think, my company provided me. They're I know, scary. I think that's what happens when you work in the private sector, frankly. They buy you expensive headphones as you get sent home. <laughs> uh, <laughs> she works for a small consultancy who actually is a social enterprise. I shouldn't say mm -hmm. um, Called PPL. And PPL was so taken aback by our um, uh, project and thought it was so useful that they made someone available to work as a project manager for us, which is obviously wonderful and has made it possible for us to get as far as we have done. Um, we are hoping over the course of the weekend, and I feel terrible to say that because the poor people at IAB have been working flat out, but that's what they do. They are hoping that we can soft launch the website on Monday. So real people can see it in the real world on Monday. And then the auto upload so that people can upload their own stories should be working then. Um, but we are not doing a big marketing push right now because we want to make sure that it kind of works and that um, there are no hiccups and people understand what they're asked to do. And in a way, we can test that by only having a small number of people trying to do so next week. Um, and then we are going to hopefully assemble a large number of narratives. And then we will, in a second wave, think about how we market this towards decision makers. Um, because one thing I, I really want to emphasize, and I think I've said it before, but just to kind of be really clear, we're not doing this as a sort of uninterested piece of ethnography. We are not doing a research project, really, where we kind of ask people to give us their data and then we use their data. We really want this to be much more about involvement um, and about people um, being able to join a community that tries to make sense of stuff together. And then in very practical ways, some of them might want to help us make sense of further stuff, but even just by putting their little tile into a big mosaic that we can zoom out and look at it and we understand the picture of what's going on that none of us would be able to understand on our own. So in my mind, it's really important that we talk about this as something that tries to make change happen rather than just something that's kind of interesting or beautiful. Uh, and, you know, at the end of the day, we're an influencing outfit, and, and that's the kind of um, gist with which we are pursuing this work. Um, Ella, is there stuff from the chat I should say something about? There's, there's been a few questions in the chat, so I think we can probably cover those quickly. Um, Harry had a quick question that was, if, if they want to recommend a group for John Harris to work with, how would they go about that? So maybe that's something we can... Yeah, um, Harry, reach out to me. I'm very happy to pitch that to John. Um, I, I'm not that used to working with journalists. I'm coming out now as someone who's a bit of a media virgin. And uh, I've been finding it quite difficult to get to have a systematic conversation with John Harris about what we might want to do together. And um, I'm only ever having, you know, three minute conversations on the phone whilst he's on a deadline. And it's been quite difficult to sort of say, and we could do this and we could do that. And how about in four weeks time? 
it's just not how he works. So um, I've been trying to go just along with that, but um, I'm very happy, and I'm very happy to copy you into that, to pitch that thought to him. And I saw, I think, the briefing you shared with us, which was so interesting, and I'm sure there's a lot of stories we could tell about LGBT um, issues. Um, but I can't kind of make any promises because he, he's not made any promises to me either. I think he tries to get this story over the line and he's saying it might be published today or tomorrow and then he's going to think about the next story. Um, so, but yes, let's pick that up. Um, and, and then Harry Evans had a good question which we've talked a lot about in our team, which is how can we extract the insight from this to feed into policy, particularly exit strategy going forward? I know that's something yeah, I think the exit strategy is a really, um, it's for me like a really good test case to um, think about. How can we make it relevant for that? Um, one way I think we can make it relevant is because if people upload their story, they get asked to tag it. So they can say, they have to say it's about shielding or self-isolation or loneliness or shopping or carers or blah, 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 blah. There's a whole set of drop down menus. And that will obviously help us to say, oh, we've got this many stories about people who've got carers responsibilities. Let's look at those in detail. Or we've got all these stories from people who are shielding. Let's have a look at that. And that's, I think, how we can make a start at beginning to make sense of the stories we are being told and then to take them to decision makers. The very first example of something I would quite like us to influence it's obviously the shooting thing, but uh, the, the lifting of the lockdown, but that will take a while to work its way through. But an, an imminent thing is that the NHS is obviously desperately worried about people not using services um, in the way they normally do. And um, in the usual fashion the NHS does, designing a common strategy to tell people that they misunderstood everything and they should please come to A&E. And um, we are working with an organization called Traverse, who are currently interviewing 10 people who have not used NHS services that they normally would have used or used them a lot later than they normally would have used them. And we are thinking of working with them in a couple of weeks time to sort of launch the platform that we are describing here and these 10 stories of people who decided not to use NHS services and to, to kind of lock in with NHS decision makers that it's no good telling people that please come to the NHS, the NHS is open if people's experience is that the NHS is actually shut um, and that it's no good arguing with them that they got it all wrong. If that's people's experience, that's their experience. And so I think a comp strategy right now that just says, please come, we're open, is going to be completely pointless if we don't explain to people, for example, how would you use mental health services now? Because no one's been able to explain that to me right now. How would you actually get access to mental health services right now if you needed them, and you're not at the level where you need inpatient treatment. So anything underneath that, how would you get through? Um, I think we need to really unpack what goes on for people before we start going into a comm strategy. So I think that's a really good example of how we can hopefully in a couple of weeks time um, begin to explain to the NHS that it's worth understanding people's experiences properly before you start spouting messages at them. Does that make sense? Yes, Charlotte, can I just chip into this? Because I think there's a bit going on in the chat about, you know, there's enthusiasm and people are already saying, oh, I can share this with this forum or with this other forum, which is fantastic and exactly what we need. I think it would be helpful for uh, us to clarify what we're going to provide the member charities in terms of written materials. They can basically copy and paste so to, you know, to cut down on your workload and also to have some consistency about what we are saying to people. Yes, so uh, we had a team meeting yesterday and we decided, we kind of divvied up the work. So by next week, when we send you MU and newsletters and the rest of it, we will be able to send you a whole lot of material that you can use for consistent me messaging with people. That contains the consent form we're asking people to sign at the moment physically because they can't upload their stories yet, which then takes care of the consent itself. And then also tells them about why we're doing this and all of that and loads of collaterals for Twitter with some really nice pull quotes and a couple of people who've given us photos that we've accepted. Um, so we've got, I don't know, maybe half a dozen stories now. Uh, I've just been given another one this morning. Um, and we can begin to use those to explain to people what it is we're after. So um, by next week, uh, Sam, our comms officer, with the help of, of Dan and another, for another volunteer uh, comms consultant, we 
we acquired um, will send a whole load of tweet decks and all that stuff to you and information to use with your beneficiaries. But if you could quietly tap up a few people now, that would obviously be really helpful. Um, we can send you the consent form we're using um, because I think it just helps people to understand what it is they're signing up for so they can see that there's already some stories on the website. Excellent. Um, I think I need to move on, otherwise Sam is going to stand on my toes. But I've just seen that Rebecca is online. Rebecca, are you? can you unmute yourself? Is that possible? Sure. Hi. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Rebecca Steinfeld. I'm the new head of policy at National Voices. This is um, day five for me. Um, and I'm really looking forward to getting to know you better and to really um, hearing and understanding the sorts of issues that are confronting the people that you're working with and supporting at the moment. Um, and then to sort of think uh, systematically about how I can be influencing policymakers in response to those issues. Um, and just to sort of build on what Charlotte was saying specifically in relation to this project and in response to the question from from Harry about how we're going to um, uh, sort of transform the insights from, from this project into concrete change. I'm in the process right now of building on everything that Charlotte just said um, to work up a sort of a policy strategy in relation to this project that I, I suppose is sort of um, twofold in terms of you know, communicating to policymakers um, on behalf of people, but also really thinking about how to involve all of you and work with you in the room with the policymakers. Um, and I'll be keeping a very close eye um, on the COVID Voices project um, and on all the um, transcripts that come in um, to identify the issues um, specific to particular groups and also cross-cutting issues and building on the work that my colleague Ella has done, sort of really collating everything that's been coming out through these webinars and in all the contact we've had with you. So, so I'm on this. Which is just so good. I think I kind of reached peak stress last week. <laughs> and, uh, and now that Rebecca started, I can feel some of that stress uh, dropping away because it's great to have a positive person on the team because I, I kind of feel like I'm not anymore. Um, okay, so we are now going to hand over to Freddie who is, please keep the chat going about this. Please reach out to any of us about this project. We all want to answer your questions. Laura is the project manager and can deal with coordinating case studies and all the rest of it, but I'm happy to answer questions. Sam is happy. All of us are fully briefed. Do reach out and stay talking about this. But for now, we talk, we are hand over to Freddie, who will talk about other sad topics. <laughs> Thanks, Charlotte. I hope everyone can hear me okay. Obviously, let me know any time. So, yeah, I'm the policy, one of the policy managers covering health and social care at the MS Society. I uh, wanted to raise a piece of guidance with you today that you may already be well aware of and really interested in your kind of reactions and how it maps onto what you're actually seeing. So I think this relates quite well to what Charlotte was just talking about um, in terms of whether the industry is open for business or not. So this on the slide, yeah, on the 19th of the letter that went from NHS England out to the community health service, which is a bit of a nebulous one, but includes GPs and all CCGs. So it covers things like mostly out of hospital care, um, things like district nursing, but also primary care, physio, and some inpatient rehab and outpatient clinics. So quite a wide range of services. And basically what this um, letter sets out is in order to free up capacity in the NHS um, because of the crisis, how, uh, which services need to be stopped, uh, which should be continued and which should be altered in some way um, in order to keep helping people who really need it, but in a different way. Um, so this is, is covering children and adult services um, and like I say it's very wide-ranging so things like audiology to nursing support for people with long-term conditions and the, the, what's set out in this uh, letter is a very long table for each service you know what what the expectations are and these arrangements apply until the 31st of July I can see someone's asked if there can be a link Put into the chat. It's 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 on the slide. So hopefully someone. I think Sam or Ella can copy it into the chat as well. Yeah. Great. 
So, so these arrangements would apply for quite a while, um, which again is another reason why I was quite interested to think about, obviously we're in a, in a very difficult situation in NHS right now, but as we move to that sort of exit strategy or recovery you know, stage, when that comes, um, some of these restrictions could obviously remain in, in place. Um, and it's thinking about kind of what would work best for the people we support um, to continue getting some kind of service, even if it's in a different way. So I guess just to really give an overview of what it, what it's, it's stated in the letter is it's telling providers of community services that really the priority is during the pandemic, get people out of hospital and by default use digital technology to provide services as far as possible. That's something probably a lot of us are seeing happening. And interestingly, that patients who are shielding should be prioritized for all of these sorts of services, which on the one hand makes perfect sense, but also is a bit worrying that there could be people who have critical needs for other reasons uh, who may not be prioritized. So as I say, because you've entered the areas, I'm not going to be able to sort of summarize it all, but give examples. Um, what I would say is that there's barely anything on the list that is stopped completely. Most things are partially stopped. And so try, um, that relies on uh, clinicians segmenting who needs support, prioritizing those with urgent needs. And um, so for example, nursing and therapy support for people with long-term conditions is exactly that. There's recommended that it's partially stopped but segmented according to urgent needs and that annual patient reviews can be deferred if necessary, unless they can happen remotely. And medium and lower priority work should be stopped. So this isn't really surprising, but it's there's a lot of room for interpretation there. Um, and again, it's whether we feel that that's actually translating and that people are being prioritized that need to be. So some of the concerns just when I was reading this through um, this letter, that I had were, and um, there's sort of a lack of mention of contingency about when a service stops, actually what people could expect um, as an alternative and quite a few mentions of families. So for example, continuing healthcare is listed as something that's um, going to partially stop, as you might already know, reviews and full assessments have already been suspended. But there is a contingency measure that, um, you should, providers should write to adults and ask them to develop contingency plans for if they have no staff. So that's not really much reassurance. You're just asking someone to, to try and sort it out themselves. Um, I guess the other concern is that the digital by default approach obviously makes a lot of sense, but you could risk missing people out. And I already mentioned there's a concern about if you're prioritizing the shielding, could you be missing other urgent cases? And kind of a lack of clarity on what the process for prioritizing people is. Appreciate that always depends on clinical judgment, um, but it would be interesting to get more int uh, detail on that. Um, and a few other reflections really that this information is obviously public, but what do patients know is the case so when we looked on some trust websites they don't necessarily correlate with what's here or give patients any understanding of what is available and if they do it mostly is encouraging people not to attend uh, so i think the questions about um this this letter sets out you know what sort of minimum services should be continued but it will vary a lot across the country um, okay, Freddie is oh. going a bit crackly. Are you close enough to the microphone and router? Sorry about that. I'm just moving. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I can hear you. I can see a bike as well. Have you okay. covered the kind of questions you wanted to say? Yeah, out? I was just going to move on to that. So um, I think that's on the next slide in case people can't hear me. Can you move to the next slide? I, I didn't attach another slide, sorry. It's just the, the link to the, the resource. Oh, okay. Right. Oh, 
Okay, I'll, I can paste these into the chat in a minute if that's helpful. Mm -hmm. But basically, I wondered if I appreciate people may not have seen this or kind of, or they may already, but whether this sort of rings true with what you're seeing in terms of service delivery on the ground um, and whether alternatives are being deli delivered digitally. Uh, we're certainly seeing that, but not widespread enough, and it's not always clear. Um, why or what we could do to help so that's something we're looking into um, and whether you're looking at any kind of minimum service standards of your own for your speciality area so do you kind of have a more detailed understanding of um, what you think services should, should be doing having talked to professionals um, and then finally I think this for me this is just something to kind of monitor given it could be going on till July and there may be things that we do want to collectively raise with NHS England, um, but I appreciate people maybe doing that already. So I'll I'll stop there. It was really welcoming the discussion and any um, intelligent sharing, but also very happy to kind of communicate with people offline. So thank you so much, Freddie, for raising this. Um, I appreciate that this is sort of a bit more of a technical policy area uh, for people to get their heads around, but it might be useful if people could just say on the chat, is this something you've engaged with? Is this something that you think is important? Do you need to take it away and talk to your policy teams about it? Um, do you think we should do something together? Are you raising this individually? Um, Freddie, I think you've also talked to AGK about this, some of you? Yeah, it was Ruth at AGK who raised this on, on another call actually early in the week. So um, that's why I reached out to you and just thought, oh, maybe we should talk yeah. about this. So obviously a lot of older people are um, the sort of typical recipient of, of community services in their own homes. Um, we've just posted the questions into the chat. Um, Yeah, there's a plethora of guidance coming out of the out of interesting one right now. Absolutely. And it's kind of, um, I mean, in the olden days before COVID, this would have been out put out for consultation before it's been put out, you know, publicly. So I think, um, you know, we can obviously understand why this is the case, but it's also I think entirely legitimate for us to log with NHS England that this is far from desirable or perfect that these things are being put out because the sort of specialist charities we've got on the call right now they would have been very able to say in this service area we really need to maintain this thing but this is less important and so on and so on yeah i think the digital approach is something as i said that we're looking to try and work with professionals to improve and make that as good as it can be and sharing our own Kind of video content and webinars and things like that, especially on on the rehab and the physical activity side of things. Um, yeah, we're also having some conversations with various part, possible partners about um, sort of evaluating how people experience the digital first service offer, because I've sort of noticed in the last few days in particular a lot of sort of back slapping creeping in when I talk to NHS colleagues that they're so pleased with themselves that they've moved primary care largely onto telemedicine and all that and that the innovation that we've been talking about for 10 years happened like this in 48 hours and you know for a lot of people this is really wonderful and for a lot of topics it's really wonderful but i think it's important that we don't sort of blindly and with a sort of slightly naive tech enthusiasm say wonderful we've transitioned to a much more innovative service model this is now great and um, we have got some work lined up that NHS England is actually paying us to do, which was originally designed for us to talk about people's experiences of waiting. And we're gonna we're gonna give that a different flavour now and still talk about people's experiences of waiting, but we also ask them about their experiences of services moving online and onto the phone. Um, because we think sometimes that's the alternative, isn't it? You can like not attend an appointment or you attend it over the phone. And um, so we want to sort of explore that a bit. And um, Nesta and Nuffield Trust are really interested in talking to us about mm -hmm. whether we can help them with research they're doing, because they're evaluating it from a sort of professional perspective. Is it working for GPs and practice managers and so on? And they would really like um, us to do the people part of that. But it depends a bit on whether they can find a bit of money for us. 
but yeah, this is uh, definitely an issue that we should keep an eye on. Um, I think I'll leave this here now, partly because of time, but um, please reach out to Freddie or us. Um, do have a look at this guidance. And if we want to pick it up again next week, we can obviously do that. Or in the meantime, um, we can convene a call of people for whom this is um, pressing. We've done that on other issues, like this vulnerability problem, for example. We convened a number of people and, and had that conversation and then took it to policymakers. So, you know, we can we can flex what we do around this. So I think I'll ask Emily to come in now. Um, and this was something that was raised on last week's webinar um, to do with disability benefits and a campaign that's kicking off next week that we would really like to be supportive of. So Emily, if you want to give us five minutes on that, and then we can again ask members what they make of it. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Can I just double check everyone can hear me clearly? Great news. Excellent. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for um, inviting me along. Um, similar to Adam, I'm in the strange situation of volunteering in an area where I might usually be working in. Um, I normally work uh, on, on campaigning on disability benefits for MIND. I think I've got a few of my, my colleagues in this call, a kind of virtual wave to you guys. Um, and I normally represent MIND through my role in the, the steering committee for the Disability Benefits Consortium. As I'm currently on furlough, I am currently um, only representing myself and the DBC, so nothing I say, uh, there's any kind of MIND's weight behind it. Um, but yeah, we at the moment um, are looking at the, um, as many of you will probably be aware, um, last month, the government uh, provided an emergency uh, £20 a week increase to universal credit and working tax credit. Um, the fact that they have so far refused to extend that emergency increase to other benefits, specifically benefits that are more traditionally disability benefits, people for benefits for people with disabilities or with mental health problems, you know, especially employment support allowance is one. Um, the, so yeah, the fact that they have so far refused to to extend that emergency increase is something that we think is a real problem. We think that they need to extend that um, as soon as possible. So we are promoting this um, campaign, the call to extend this emergency um, £20 increase um, using the hashtag increased disability benefits. So if you go on Twitter, and have a look at that hashtag you can see a lot of what we've already been doing we've had a bit of a soft launch so far this week um i know a lot of the people on the call are dbc members and you've already been promoting that and thank you so much we um over the last week we've also done um a survey which over 200 people with disabilities mental health problems completed um and we've used that now to put together a briefing which really outlines the, the reasons that this emergency increase needs to happen um, as soon as possible. Um, just to kind of quickly go through um, those main those main issues. I mean, really the key one is a matter of discrimination. You know, plain and simple. Um, you know, as as has you know already been discussed on the call, the the current public health crisis has had a significant impact on disabled and well people. Um, and they've also, at the same time, disabled people have had to be fighting for their, their rights with the suspension of the CARE Act, concerns about healthcare discrimination, and the idea that um, people on universal credit will get this um, emergency bump, people on ESA and other disability benefits won't, is clear discrimination. There's also the issue that um, disabled people have an average of 583 extra uh, pounds worth of extra costs each month already related to their disabilities. And over the last 10 years, um, disabled people have disproportionately lost out in the, the benefits cuts and changes that have happened so far. So there's already this, this huge need. But then specifically what we, what we got from the survey that people completed is a very clear picture that disabled and unwell people have, they specifically have, um, uh, increased costs at the moment related to the COVID-19 emergency. So 95% of respondents said their costs had increased as a result of the emergency. 
92% specifically emphasised the fact they had additional costs of food. And that's just to go very quickly through some of the, the things people, people, many people said that are causing those extra costs. So for the area of food, that's specifically things like um, people who normally have to rely on food deliveries. Now all of those slots are being taken up, so it's very hard for people to get them. They will be more likely to be unable to risk leaving their homes at the moment because they're shielding or having to be extra cautious. Um, being more likely to have medically restricted diets, which are harder and more expensive to source at the moment. You know, the people told us um, that they nor might normally rely on extra support for friends or family if they have a flare or they need um, extra help for having meals and they now don't have access to friends or family who are isolating. Um, and then the, just the you know, practical issues like to be able to get into supermarkets, many people are having to queue for 30 minutes, and that's not accessible for many people who can't stand in a queue for that, that length of time. Then uh, moving on from food, another key area where people are seeing increases are utilities. You know, many disabled people are more likely to have to shield at home. They're more likely to be needing to stay in their house 24 seven, which is causing higher utility costs. Um, so people needing to take additional precautions to protect their health. You know, we had some people tell us that they they're having to be very they're you know they're on disability benefits which already aren't enough. They're having to be extra cautious, ready with turning their their water heater on. They might do that just to have a shower, but they're now having to do it to wash their hands at regular intervals. They're being extra careful to protect their health. People who've had their care reduced and so are now more isolated. And having to spend more, much more money on phone bills. Um, and then the other two areas that people mentioned, one was around extra cost of travel and transport. Um, so having to take taxis to medical appointments or to get medication or paying for other people to go and collect shopping and medication. And then the final area that people really emphasized was the additional costs to manage their already pre-existing health condition or disability at the moment. So people who are unable to get to their usual medical appointments and needing to buy medical equipment to manage conditions themselves, um, needing to minimize the, the increased risk they face, you know, having to have PPE for themselves and their carers. And then also the fact that people are experiencing um, a mental and physical health impact just of the, the panic, the pandemic, and the lockdown and being, being trapped inside your house and having to spend extra money to manage manage that. Um, you know, Emily, um, would, you, would you move on to asking members what they um, yes, what you want them to do? We're running out of time. Um, yes, so so that's why this is so important. Um, so um, any any DBC members who are already on our email list about, about ten minutes ago. Um, so I've been busy whilst on this call. Um, received all of the content that you need to be able to share this on Monday. So we're, trying, we're having a kind of focused day of action on Monday. Um, so um, if you would like to share the, the action we've got, which is up on the screen there, um, the 38 degrees petition, it'd be great if you could share that. It'd be great if you could tweet using the hashtag uh, increased disability benefits. But also if you, if you would like to support uh, in any way, you can just email me at my my email address is right there emilybutler55 at gmail.com again furloughed can't use my official email address um, and then i can send you over um, a copy of the briefing the draft tweets you can use some images you can use with stats from the survey and and all of that content um so yeah if you if you would like to support then please feel free to email me and i'll get that all over to you this afternoon Thank you so much, Emily. I'm sorry it's been a bit rushed. Um, a whole lot of insight there again and content and really important arguments. Um, Emily's email address, I think Ella just put them in the chat as well, if you just want to click on that. Um, if you want to sign up to that material and um, go on social media on Monday and, and support their work, it's uh, bound to be very relevant to a lot of the people you are supporting. Right, it's time for us to sort of wrap up. Um, quick recap of the stuff we've been doing and then ask for feedback really as to whether we're doing the right things and whether we're focusing on the stuff that will add the most value. Um, so we are 
still raising issues you have with decision makers. Ella, I think, sent our third briefing off to people um, in NHS England, NHS Improvement, NHS X, CQC, RCGP. Um, and so if you have something that you don't know how to land, please, uh, or if you just want an extra voice raising it, do let us know. We can, um, we can take it to those places. Um, as I said, we are um, reframing some of the project work we've been commissioned to do to add more value to the sort of stuff we now need to understand better. So, for example, understanding people's experiences of moving to digital. We are going to discuss next week with you on the webinar um, the, our plans for a national conference in the autumn, which we always intended to focus on inequalities 10 years on from Marmot to keep the conversation going on Marmot, but we're now thinking we need to focus it on inequalities in the aftermath of COVID. And so we want to t test some of our thinking with you um, next week and um, hear your thoughts and get, get a sense of whether you think we're onto something. And we're also making quite tough decisions about are we planning for a physical event or are we planning for a digital only conference and what would that look like? Um, most of you um, will have signed this joint statement we issued last week. So just to remind us that, that that's still on. And I think we've got 90 signatures for that now. 90 organizations have aligned themselves with that, which is great. I saw people refer to it um, in the media and in um, conversations I've been having at, at NHS England and CQC. We very late last week, um, I think actually it was on Saturday, <laughs> Um, we wrote to DHSC about funding for the health sector just to get a foot in the door to say um, we might not be what you call the front line, i.e. we are not all dropping off food paths on other people's front steps, but we are supporting people very directly with information and advice and online support. And if you decide that that's not the front line you will extend funding to, then we're in deep schmuck. And we are now following this up, moving on to the right column of this slide, with gathering evidence for the DCMS um, Select Committee inquiry, um, where I think uh, Sam is just sharing the, the link, um, which please, 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 you need to fill in and tell us. Um, it's coordinated by the Georgina from the Neurological Alliance. Um, what the impact has been on an uptake on your helpline, uptake for your digital information. Are you aware of specific problems your cohorts have with the COVID situation and what are they? And it's a very short, apparently takes five minutes. I think it might take seven or 10. Um, and um, we will then collate all of that and report back to the DCMS. Sam, if you just go um, one slide back uh, upwards. Yeah, just to remind people what we're planning to do next week. So we are launching our COVID voices platform. Very exciting. And we're collecting, um, Rebecca will lead on that, evidence for two select committee inquiries. One is the DCMS one that looks at the impact of COVID on the charity sector, where we're doing a survey together with the Neurological Alliance and we will collate what you tell us and we will take it to um, the select committee. And the other one is one that was launched yesterday, I think. Department, uh, the Health and Social Care Select Committee have said they want to do an inquiry into the impact of COVID on non-COVID healthcare. And we think that's exactly the topic that we, as 150 charities, kind of own, because we are the people who are the people with those ongoing conditions that we mustn't forget about. So Rebecca, again, will have a think about how can we really add value there. In the first uh, inquiry, in the first session, looking at think, cancer, mental health, and maternity, and we think we might leave that to those of you who lead on those topics. But there are loads of overarching issues, some of them we've talked about today, community services, digital first, digital exclusion, food, you know, all that stuff that we can pick up together and make sure that the department, that the select committee hear about. Right, so that's um, the plan for next week. I've been told by the team to also tell you, so we're doing next Friday in a webinar on inequalities. On the chat, we've picked up quite a lot of talk about digital exclusion and food, which has obviously all both been bubbling up, bubbling up in our kind of inboxes too. So we're thinking maybe doing a webinar about that in due course. Um, and Sam has asked me to tell you to email him with any feedback you've got about 
this format about today's webinar or generally about our webinars, we're thinking hard, but obviously with no money, about how we could make this more accessible to people. Um, but you know, if you could tell us whether this works for you and it might not work for from your side, that would be great. Also, if you've got any topics you want us to raise, um, you can do that then. So anything else anyone wants to raise, log for next week or for coming weeks, uh, topics we should cover? I'll just chat up for a minute and let you chat or talk. But if not, then um, just to say, Rebecca will uh, reach out to you with a number of um, thoughts around how we can work with these two select committees. We are cracking on with organizing some uh, webinars. Yes, and the chat that seems to be landing quite all right. Um, and then um, we are obviously hoping that you will collaborate with us in getting people's voices heard and getting people's experiences onto the table um, and into the open so that we can um, together make sure that future decisions are fully aware of what actually goes on for people. So that's the big thing we're going to try to make happen next week and the following weeks, and it would be great if you could support us. Do get in touch and um, do, Ella, did you want to say something from the chat? We're not, um, Friday's a bank holiday next week. Is the webinar on Friday next week or is it on a different day? I think it's the week after that. Oh, it's, so it will be two weeks holiday. until, yes. oh, okay. So next week we're going to do inequality. I think that's the first. Um, and we might roll food into that because obviously that's quite relevant. Um, or we might do a standalone one. And then the following week, we are thinking of the Friday is not a work day, and we're thinking of doing more of a sort of morning webinar for some policymakers. I think all of you would also be invited to, to talk a bit more about our project and to talk about this work I've just mentioned, the research into why people aren't using health services right now, which we think we should get in front of people who are at the moment designing a bad comms campaign. <laughs> Maybe we can um, prevent another bad NHS comms campaign going out. Um, yeah, DEFRA, there's a lot of, um, some of us are plugged into the, the food stuff and we will definitely make sure that that gets given an airing here because it's very relevant to very uh, to many vulnerable people. Okay, it's been such a pleasure to see you and hear you and uh, engage with you again today. Um, you can tell we are really busy. I know you are all really busy as well. So I'm really grateful that you make the time to spend this hour with us so that we can see how we can add value to each other's work and, and make sure we don't just work really hard, but that we also actually have an impact. Um, thank you from the team, Ella and Sam behind the scenes making these webinars work, Rebecca cracking on with the policy side of things, Jess thinking really hard about how we're going to um, do the um, conference in the autumn and what that looks like these days in the times of cholera. And um, Patrick, who you probably don't see that much of at the moment, really keeping the show on the road. Believe it or not, we're transitioning to a new IT provider and a new IT system in the middle of all of this. Um, and he's making sure we're not uh, losing our sanity over all of that. So I'm really grateful to the team, really grateful to all of you. Do stay in touch and um, let's move this thing. Thank you. Bye-bye.